So I want to welcome everyone. I'm Margaret Carney, and I'm director of the International Museum of Dinnerware Design, and I welcome you all. Thank you for participating. Uh, tonight is the third of our unforgettable dinnerware virtual presentations, which are in partnership with the Ann Arbor District Library. And if you've missed any of our previous talks, uh, one was a behind the scenes tour of the International Museum of Dinnerware Design, or uh, a month ago, Eva Zeisel, an unforgettable designer and an unforgettable life. You can visit our website at dinnerwaremuseum.org and there'll be links to the library's postings and YouTube. So tonight we're going to be talking with Julia Galloway, an unforgettable dinnerware of Julia Galloway with a focus on her endangered species series. And before we begin that virtual adventure with Julia in her studio in Montana, um, I want to thank her ahead of time for letting us come to her studio, but I want to show you a couple of things first. And first of all, it wouldn't be me on Zoom if I wasn't doing a plug for you becoming a member of the uh, International Museum of Dinnerware Design and supporting us. And then you get this wonderful newsletter in the mail and you get your name listed with all your friends that have already signed up to be members. But really what I want to show you are some pieces of Julia's in the collection because um, she wasn't invited because uh, we didn't love her work because we do love her work. Um, one of our first exhibitions in 2012 is a show where she was invited as an artist. And these are some dinnerware pieces, including its two place settings uh, with wonderful imagery on them and gold and silver luster. And besides the plate and bowl, there are uh, cups, large and small, with beautiful drawings on them, which you'll love. Oops, don't want to break anything. And then I want to show a teapot that I purchased for the museum a couple of years ago. And I think you'll see immediately why I purchased this tea teapot. This teapot is dinnerware on dinnerware. So Julia drew this fantastic image of a table all set with dinnerware on this teapot, which is dinnerware. And then besides that, on the back side is um, the dishes in the sink. So I love this because how many times do you get dinnerware on dinnerware? Um, and it's a wonderful piece. And then the, the piece I purchased at Enseca, a plug for the National <laughs> Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts. Um, in 2018, I purchased um, it might have been from the art stream, I'm not sure. But anyway, right. uh, yep. and I think this is from her, her um, endangered species series. And it's a bat, if you can see that clearly. So that hangs in my office. So I now would like to uh, say one more thing about housekeeping, and that is that um, you all will be muted and uh, we won't see your little faces until the, the question session after Julia's done presenting. And at that time, well, as we're talking, you can go ahead and put questions in the chat or you can save your questions and raise your hand at the end and you'll be unmuted and we can see you and uh, that's how that will work. Okay, I wanna tell you about Julia Galloway. I think you already know her, you wouldn't be here tonight, but Julia is a potter and a professor of ceramics at the University of Montana in Missoula. Her work is in well-known collections such as the Renwick Gallery in Washington, D.C., which is part of the Smithsonian Institution. Her work is in the Long Beach Art Museum in California, the Ceramic Research Center at Arizona State Art Museum, and the American Museum of Ceramic Art in Pomona, California. She was awarded a United States Artist Grant and named a Distinguished Scholar at the University of Montana. And currently, and I think we'll see a bit of this tonight, her pottery is inspired by the growing list, unfortunately, of endangered species in the United States. So uh, please welcome Julia Galloway. Hi, everybody. So excited to be here. Um, tonight, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you a PowerPoint for maybe about half of our time showing you different, um, uh, different work that I've made that falls sort of within the guidelines of dinnerware, a little bit of that structure, and then show you the endangered species um, dinnerware project kind of right at the end there. But I want to take you through maybe uh, 15 or 20 minutes of different bodies of work, which I have <clears throat> sort of moved 
uh, dinnerware from the table up onto the wall, up onto the ceiling, different ways of sort of looking and evaluating dinnerware. So I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you so much, Margaret, for inviting me. I'm just delighted. Greeting from Missoula, Montana. Um, we, uh, uh, all of our crocus and daffodils are up, but we're getting six inches of snow tomorrow. So we'll see how that goes. Um, if you have questions, just put them in the chat and then Margaret's gonna sort of help me respond to those uh, over time. We'll have time at the end for questions and answers. And um, after the PowerPoint, I'll just do a, uh, maybe a demo about how I made this plate. And uh, this is one of the, uh, this is an endangered toad um, and sort of show you guys uh, how to do inlay. For people that are making work on a regular basis, this will not be that interesting to you, but um, people who aren't making pots, that might be a curious thing to see. So I think uh, I'm gonna dive right into uh, our PowerPoint for today. Okay. Uh, can I just get a thumbs up if, if you guys can see the screen okay? Margaret, can they see the screen? Yes, we can. Somebody? Yes. Great, thanks so much. Okay. So, <clears throat> oops, hold on. So uh, I just wanted to address, dinnerware is such a uh, really quite wide open term to me, and I understand it more and more broadly all the time, but I was thinking today about why I'm so drawn to it. And I'm drawn to dinnerware because of how it embraces uh, domesticity uh, in such an outstanding way. And I really loved looking at rooms like this when I was young at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, they had some period rooms, and they all had plates on the walls. And I loved that a plate could be simultaneously decoration in the house, that where you would get visual and um, really aesthetic nourishment and then you could take it down and use it where you would really get physical nourishment. And I just love the idea of those two things coming together. And I think that really dinnerware, these are both table settings from the White House. And I just think like dinnerware is like the... Um, kind of fashion runway of ceramics. You know, there's all these different areas of ceramics. There's sort of the wabi-sabi tea bowl genre. And then there's the sort of high design genre. And uh, I think dinnerware is really, I mean, look at this. This is like a fashion to the max. This is a dinnerware party outside of the Met in New York. That is just crazy. And I was looking at this and thinking about this kind of fashion runway of dinnerware and how dinnerware can be anything and found these fabulous images of these models wearing blue and white. So that's like a little bit like dinnerware in reverse. But I just love that idea a little bit about dishes um, really in dinnerware um, pushing past uh, the content that we think of usually. So I'll just start with some really, oh, and then I, the other thing I was thinking about a little bit is that never have we've been so aware of dinnerware, dinner table settings since Downton Abbey. And um, uh, being a friend of mine would watch the show often and I would pause it all the time so I could see what dishes they were using. And um, I just love the uh, sort of realisticness of it and how beautiful the dishes moved all around the um, place settings and in and out of the kitchens and so much of the tasks of the people who worked and lived in this house was based around this dinnerware. So never has dinnerware been so prominent in our contemporary culture is since, um, or this kind of dinnerware since I'm Downton Abbey. I sort of love that. So <clears throat> I wanted to start with some very early, early dinnerware. I made this a gazillion years ago for an auction at Haystack. And it was part of a show that was, um, uh, we were supposed to make some pots that were sort of mischievous. And so I made this set of dinnerware that all had poisonous plants on it. And I thought that was like a great little kind of mischievous, kind of clever, clever thing. And you can see that the um, aesthetic is really rooted in kind of um, Amari ware, Japanese ware with those fine lines and kind of runny green glaze. But I did sort of like how um, plates could absorb so much content so in such a clever way. And then this was a big plate set that I did. And when I showed it, we spread it across it huge table, 16 by 16 foot table. And they really look like lily pads floating there and they sort of changed your sense of space. And that's what I really sort of aware of, became aware of the power of many. Now I'm gonna do a quick pivot here because of Margaret. And I wanna show you, this is the uh, teapot that she just showed us. And this is from a show where um, different pots have different rooms in my house. And so when you walk through the show, you were walking through my house. But I loved these dishes. I loved how messy my house was and I would just draw however it looked. And there were 
dishes in the sink and dishes on the table. And um, if you can see in the bottom right, there's some red flowers in a vase. And behind that, you can see the swing set in my neighbor's yard behind the windows. And I just think that's so fabulous. So here's another, uh, here's a few more of the teapots from that show. And I love the sort of intimacy of this. This is a double spouted teapot. And when you pour out of it, the liquid would twist like a rope when you're pouring. And um, clearly there's some fabulous uh, lettuce or broccoli in that strainer next to the sink. Anyways, uh, back to dinnerware. Um, <clears throat> after a, a little while after that big set of uh, water lily plates, I was invited to do a show about people's work who had been um, <clears throat> influenced by Isnikware. And it was a show in a consulate in New York City in, in Brooklyn. And um, so it was all people that had been influenced by Isnik Ware. And there was two Americans. And then there was uh, oh, two women from Iran and a woman from Turkey. And a man, a potter from Iraq was in it. And also from, uh, uh, also from England and Europe. And so I made this arch <clears throat> that had all of the settings that you would have in a dinnerware plus a little bit more. So I saw these pictures sort of as making some kind of fence or border, right? And then this big sort of arch made out of these, uh, these plates that are very influenced by Isnik Ware. And then up in the very top, I had all of these clouds. And so <clears throat> the thought was sort of about how um, we would share food. So we would pour pictures into these cups and we all sort of came together. The show was meant to be a way that different cultures could come and show together. And so these are some of the plates that are kind of lifting up into the sky, making this arch. And I wanted those pictures to be sort of part balustrade and part entering in the arch. And so here are some examples of those cups. This is maybe the back side or the front side. So we had some area of the cup that was super stable and predictable and some area of the cup that was very runny and sort of moving. And I love those two things together. And um, I thought having these cloud cups way up in the sky, I felt like really expanded the depth of this arch and kind of helped move it out of it, this little room into sort of um, gives you a better sense of space. One thing that was kind of amazing about this arch is that all of these diplomats came to this show because it was supposed to be sort of a, uh, a show where different artists and different cultures came together. And when they got all their photographs taken, um, they would stand in this arch. And so there's images of these arch in all of these different newspapers around the world with the um, different diplomats standing inside of the arch. And that just seemed like just so fabulous to me. It seems so great. And um, when we took down the show, a lot of the artists came to take down the show together and we took all the plates off the wall and then we shared a meal on these small plates. It was really quite a, quite a wonderful event of people coming together. So sort of based off of that and thinking about these clouds, this was <clears throat> when I moved to Montana, I became so aware of the sky and that the sky really um, is defined by the clouds that are in it. And I was thinking so much about these arches and the arch from that previous show. And I love the idea of the clouds sort of floating through the arch or floating in and out of the building. So this is a dinnerware set that would sit in the middle of your table and it would sort of stay there and you would use it, you'd wash it and you'd put it back out. So it was a a dinner plate, a salad plate, a bowl, and a cup. It was a set of two. And you guys, I have to tell you, I'm not this smart. I would not figure out this way of making my um, sort of thing that stayed on my table at all times to be my dinner, where I never would have come up for that idea, except for, of course, the most fabulous, uh, uh oh, a little trouble. Here we go. Eddie Dominguez. Um, this is the a, a dinnerware set of Eddie Dominguez on the left and one of his cupboards on the right. And so this piece of Eddie Dominguez, which is also on the cover of the most recent publication from the museum. You know, it's just brilliant. You know, those big leaves are dinnerware plates and then the cups stack up to be stems of the flowers and then the flowers are bowls. And it's just so beautiful how this is the centerpiece of the table and it sits and it stays right on the table. And then when you have your dinner, you're gonna take this off and you're gonna use it all, wash it, put it all back. I just thought that was just genius. And I just loved that, like, let's get the dishes out of the cupboard. You know, I just loved this idea so much. So this is now looking at Eddie's work. Boy, this looks so reserved. But, um, you know, it's really an exciting idea 
to sort of figure out different ways that um, pots could move sort of in and out of my um, kitchen or in and out of my life. And um, the person that has this uh, that has this set, it always is on her kitchen table all the time. And she uses these dishes for all of her meals, which just pleases me. So, <clears throat> uh, so in thinking about the clouds, I did work on a big dinnerware set made out of clouds. This is a big, huge uh, 14 dinner, uh, 14 for, setting for 14. And it was uh, big plates, small plates, dessert plates, dinner plates, big bowls, small bowls, cups, wine cups and mugs. And um, I'm sorry about the quality of these photographs. That's my work table at school as I'm trying to figure out how to match these dishes up. But I think there was something about working with these clouds and how the plates were also sort of cloud shaped. And um, there was a sort of luminous Celadon-esque glaze on there that really helped these float. And uh, it was just amazing. You could stack them up any way and it would work. And I love that idea of the clouds sort of um, kind of, uh, the clouds sort of moving on top of each other and away from each other in the way that they do. And so from that, <clears throat> I started to work on these cloud plates quite a bit. And I thought, well, if I'm gonna really do these cloud plates and I'm gonna make a sky. So I made about 600 of these cloud plates, all different shapes. And I had a show in um, Great Falls, Montana in the Paris Gibson Museum. And so this, we're in this one room in the museum and I brought these 600 plates to the museum. And you can see on the right side there, uh, some folks helping me and we're hanging them. It's a 20 foot ceiling. And so we're hanging all of these plates in different cloud formations from the ceiling. And these images are a little bit, um, the room was pretty dark. And so the images are not exactly true. But I think here, this very odd fish angle lens, you can get a little bit of a sense. Uh, Great Falls, Montana is a farming community and it's way out on the plains in Eastern Montana. And it's a conservative uh, sort of small, small city, conservative small city. And the Paris Gibson Museum is an old school building. One of the old, old school buildings that with the big creaky wooden floors and the big classrooms. And so this is one of the classrooms and um, I painted the walls to go from dark to light and then hung these down from the ceiling and then I lit it from the bottom. And so <clears throat> I had plate clouds on the wall and then plate clouds coming down from the ceiling. And then the shadows from the lights also cast some really wonderful uh, clouds again on the walls. This museum had a lovely gift shop and um, these gals used to come to the gift shop and um, very often the farmers would stay in their trucks when their wives would come to the gift shop. And so um, once a farmer came in kind of early in the show and he came in and looked around at the show and he liked it and he drove drag a chair from the hallway into the gallery. So Paris Gibson called me and they asked if I, they could put a bench in the room. And I said, of course. And then they put two benches in the room. And so when the family would sort of come to get something at the gift shop or come take an art class in the basement, there was some art rooms or something, that very often um, the patriarch of the house very often would go and sit in this room. It was a very hot old school building and I had them turn the AC on this room on full. So that when you walked into this room, it was quite cool and it was quiet. You can see here how the plates are hung from wires. And, uh, and the wires really resemble, <clears throat> if you've been in the West and you can see a storm coming, a rainstorm coming from far away. And it really has this sort of density of these wires, like this sort of sense of rain on them. And um, so <clears throat> at the opening, I made, a lot of little plates, little cloud plates. And when people came to the opening reception, we put the food that was grown by the local farmers on these plates and then they would eat their food that they grew from the sky. And so they were basically eating from where they were from. And the um, farming community really understood this work in a way that surprised me, um, just the depth of which they understood it. 
and uh, they've got some really um, sort of wonderful write-ups in the local paper. It was great. Um, one thing that was wonderful was when I took the show down um, here, where the benches were set up. Uh, you know, we turned on the lights, we unwrapped all the things, we took all the pots and everything, and there was all of these sort of dark spots on the wall, about four feet up. And I couldn't figure out what they were. And we're wrapping and putting things up and priming the walls and all that, getting it back to white. And I finally realized that that was where the um, gentlemen would lean their heads back when they were sitting against the wall, they would lean their heads back. And that was the grease from their heads or their hats was making a mark on the wall. And boy, that was like the best compliment I've ever gotten in my life about um, somebody responding to the show that they would relax and um, look back at this. So um, this sort of idea about using pots to create an environment or to pay homage to something is, uh, is very near and dear to my heart. Um, if you're familiar with my work, you'll recognize that some of these uh, bodies of work are out of order. And that was just to make sense of them. So <clears throat> some time ago, I really fell in love with John James Audubon. And I know that he's a very controversial figure now and he's very complicated, but I think these drawings are beautiful. And even though I struggle myself with John James Audubon, the man, I um, am very in love with his drawings. And I was very taken that he was drawing all the birds of North America. And um, mostly what I loved was that he was so obsessed about doing this that he learned how to draw with both hands. And I really do understand that level of obsession if you think about how many cloud plates that was. And then um, I started to do all the birds of North America on cups. And so I just started and I looked at his drawings and I put his drawings on my cups as carefully and thoughtfully as I could. And I loved the fragility and strength of the porcelain of the cups and how these um, beautiful little species were finding their homes. So I went ahead and did all the um, birds of North America and there's about 1200 of them. And uh, this is a show in at the Clay Studio in Philadelphia. And um, this is sort of all the walls spread out, the three walls spread out, so you could kind of get a gist of what I was doing. And on the walls is um, sort of fresco chalk, and it matched the glaze on the other side of the cups. So perhaps down here, you could see a little bit how these would sort of start to match. And that was so you could turn the cups around. And at the beginning of the opening, all of the cups, all of the birds here were facing the wall. And by the end of the opening, all of the birds were facing out, which I just loved that during the opening, all of those cups had gotten turned around. Now these little shelves that are a little bit awkward, these large shelves, they look a little like bird houses. In these shelves, there is a um, motion sensor and a sound module. There's a little speaker in there. So when you go and you pick up this cup, that little sound module, I mean, that little module motion sensor senses you. And then the bird song of that bird comes out of this little speaker. And I just wanted the connection with the pots to kind of surpass um, the it being tactile or that you would use it or something. I wanted to fill up the gallery with a fuller experience. And I thought it was gonna be this like really beautiful kind of quiet, you know, little tweet, tweet, tweet as you're looking at these pots and it would be like ideal, you know, be like, ah, look at this beautiful place in the middle of the city and there's a couple of bird songs. Well, you guys, it was like a hundred friggin' birds and it was so loud. And, um, and uh, at the opening, in the beginning of the opening, there were some uh, small kids there and they figured out this thing about the, the motion sensors and they were like doing laps around the gallery to set off the sensors, which I thought was fabulous to have these kids kind of so excited about all these bird songs, you know? And then um, the other thing I didn't realize at the time was how endearing certain birds are to certain people. And so people were very invested in finding the bird that had meaning to them. So we had to put the cups up alphabetically so that they could find their bird. And it was confusing, like the red nut hatch, is that under R for red or N for nut or H for hatch? You know, it's a little bit, it was sort of complicated. And uh, I also got a visit from, during this kind of wild ruckus opening with the kids running around and then the parents trying to find the bird they love and taking the birds off the shelf and then trying to get it back on the right shelf. It was kind of very hectic. 
but there was a couple of gals who came to um, see the show and they looked at each cup very closely and they were there for about an hour. I was kind of amazed. And so I went and introduced myself and this one gal came right up to me and she said, well, hi, thank you. We'd like the show, but um, one of the cups is wrong. And I thought, one of the cups is wrong. Like, what are you talking about? And she said, the gross beak, the beak is too small. And I said, what? And so I said, show me. And I am Chris in my mind. I was like, are you kidding? 1200 cups and like the gross beak is wrong. Like, oh my gosh. Right. But I said, you know, like fanatics are fanatics and I made, you know, 600, 500 cloud plates and 1200 bird cups. A fanatic knows a fanatic. So anyways, uh, she showed me and she was right. It, it, it was a little small and um, there were three of them. And I said, well, which other ones are wrong? And well, there were seven of them that I had gotten a little bit wrong. And um, oh, I just loved that they were there. They were from the Audubon Society and they were just come to check it out. So um, there was something about this kind of opening and opening with the clouds that really made me reconsider how people were entering galleries and entering spaces that had useful pots in them and having it set up for display in a way that would help you understand the content of the work. So that was really what it is. Now on the fourth wall, <clears throat> which led into the gallery, there was this um, blue wall that had these uh, little plates on it. So um, this was the name of the show, Quiescent, which was kind of a miss, honestly. But um, the uh, I love these, you know, clear porcelain white blue plates, white plates with blue decorating on a blue wall. I thought that it was really stunning. And that really stuck in my mind. So <clears throat> as I was making the cloud plates and I started to get interested in the endangered species for a really large variety of reasons. And I was invited to do a show um, where we were gonna display uh, pot, we were gonna display our work uh, horizontally. And we were given this wooden shape to work on so at the time I was thinking quite a bit about um, extinction and I was thinking about, um, uh, I was studying fish at the time actually. And so all of these gold plates around the outside, these are all extinct fish from the Great Lakes. And I thought, you know, if I was a fish and I was extinct, where would I like to live? And I thought I would like to live in the clouds. So I made this, it's called a heaven for fish. So I made this setup of plates with the goldfish for a place for these uh, extinct species to live. And I just put those red dishes in there. They have little gold insects on them. Uh, so they'd have some bait. And uh, so here they are. And um, you know, I, this is very moving to me as I was setting it up and it was a tricky setup. You had to work from the inside out and um, I had to have the right amount of dishes. It was complicated, but I just loved the idea of these extinct fish sort of floating through the sky. It reminded me a little bit of the clouds and the trays and the architectural trays. So <clears throat> this sort of started, uh, this is sort of early on in me being interested in endangered species. And, um, you know, endangered species, they're heavy, right? It's a heavy subject and it's a subject that we feel mostly powerless about. And uh, in some ways we are, but, <clears throat> you know, I am from the generation when AIDS was sort of rampant when I was in college and high school. And the sort of problem, one of the problems with the AIDS crisis is that um, it was happening to a population that for the most part nationally was not very visible. And when it became visible, like when ACT UP got really involved with um, AIDS, ACT UP started, it made something that was basically not visible, very visible, like the AIDS quilt. And that really stuck with me when I saw the AIDS quilt. I lost my best friend in college to AIDS. and. Um, so I started to think about how do you make something which is relatively invisible, like an endangered species visible. So I started to work on these plates for endangered species. And these are commemorative plates. And um, here I am making them. So these, I make them in molds. I'm gonna show you how to do this today. So this is a bunch of them that I'm making here, pressed out of a mold they're drying. And here they all are all covered with slip and then I'll wipe away the extra in that line drawing will be inside. Here I am drawing them. And then here are some 
with just the slip. These are just process shots for the studio nerds involved. So this is, uh, you see the holes in the back, that's how I hung them. And I pressed them out of these molds. There's quite a few of them. And I think there was about maybe, um, maybe 1,500 of these plates. Maybe not that many, maybe it's more like, wait, wait, let me get this right. I think it was about 900 plates. And um, this is endangered species that are endangered, threatened, or of concern. So species that are concerned um, in the state of Pennsylvania. So endangered species, hold on, let me get through this a little bit. So here I am drawing, right? And I'm drawing this bird right here on my plate. And I've sort of sketched it out with the help of that bird. And then I'm gonna come in and work on the decoration. So these are all the species here drawn. A lot of dragonflies that are um, being threatened in Pennsylvania. And uh, they're just drying here on this cart, getting ready to go into the Biscount. And then here are some on a wall. And on the back of each one, I had some information about the species, why it was endangered and um, what you could do to help it. So on the species, this is my niece. She did a lot of the research for me. Um, but on the back of the species, behind this drawing, there was luster. So this is silver luster and this is gold luster. And so this silver luster, it's reflective enough that you can actually see yourself in it. So the ones that were gold had recovered and were no longer on the list and the ones that were silver were still endangered. So <clears throat> it was tricky. I couldn't just do the cute furry things. I had to do everything. I can't say that an anthropod is less important than you know, uh, a totally charming little, uh, you know, ferret or something, I had to really do them all. So I had to do the mussels and then the paddlefish. These are the most bizarre fish. If there's any fishermen in the group today, or if anybody's seen one of them, they're very odd. And um, so, and then here are some butterflies and snakes. And uh, it was very interesting when <clears throat> at some point the image also could become pattern. And that was very, very interesting to me visually. But why I put all this luster on the front, all of this gray area, is that I wanted you to see your own reflection uh, in the plates. So I wanted you to be part of the plate in some way. So <clears throat> these are just a few. The thing about it too, which is tricky, is you have to do all of them. You know, you can't just do the cute ones. And like snakes kind of are a little bit they make me a little bit nauseous, a little. I kind of, they kind of freak me out a little bit. But you have to do them anyways. You can't say no snakes and you know yes to the pigeon, no to the snake. You know you can't do it. You got to do it all. You got to do the sturgeons. You got to do the arachnoids. You got to do the spiders. And um, so here is my sisters that came to help me hang this up. And this was at a show in Enseca. And I wasn't that sure about the gallery space, but the gallery space was long and narrow, and there was a lot of other work in the space. Mine was in the very, very back. And so when you walked into the gallery, you'd look back there and you'd be like, oh, shiny, so pretty. And then you'd get a little bit closer and you'd be like, oh, blue and white, so pretty. And then you kind of get a little bit closer and then you could see people's like posture changing as they started to realize what the show was about. And the minute they saw the title on the wall, they would slump. And then by the time they were halfway through this wall, there was like people were like crying. It was like a very moving show to me. There's this long, long line of people waiting to come in. And when you stood in front of it, you couldn't see the plates wrapped around the whole back of the wall up onto the edges of the wall a little bit. And um, you know, there was something about this. I, I wasn't big on the idea of making people feel bad. I really hated that part. But I also thought that maybe it had worked. And by making something relatively unseen seen, um, that, that, that was a powerful thing. And I heard people say things like, oh yeah, I haven't heard that cricket since I was a kid. Or, um, and oddly enough, with all of these plates, the most popular one was a grub. There was this little, I don't know if we can see it here, but right, and some of it's because it was eye height, but there was this little kind of wormy grub plate and people, they just loved that. That was their favorite, which just pleased me to no end. So here's a couple of these plates. Now, of course, since they're full of luster, um, you can't really be eating off these. The luster is soft. Um, and I'm okay with them being commemorative. Um, it's you sort of have a different relationship with them, right? You would put them up in your house instead of in your cupboard. And I was, I was really okay with that. 
though I think it was a little bit of a departure from my traditional, really strong utilitarian pottery background. So here's a couple of examples. And these are also some, this uh, is a wall from species that are all endangered in Montana. And so this is my home state. So, uh, so <clears throat> people did send me photos of where they put them. So this is somebody's living room where they put them all up here. And then I just got this one from Krista and she's eating a bagel, a bagel off of her bat plate, which I just, I thought was kind of really uh, lovely. And um, I don't know, I was just glad to see that it was sort of in, in part of somebody's day. And I've gotten wonderful photos of these and people's in their bathrooms, over their showers, um, in their kitchens. Um, you know, these hang these all over the house. And I used to think I'd be so honored if somebody used my mug for coffee every day. But now I'm kind of honored that, you know, this is going up, hanging up over their grandmother's china or over their grandmother's silver set or something like that. So um, I did also, uh, I have also been working on dinnerware sets that include these species. So <clears throat> these are uh, actually, this is a bird dinnerware set. And what I love so much that you can see here is that the bird is actually reflecting in the silver on the back of the plate. And this also happens on the set that the dinnerware museum has that you can set it up just right. So the pattern that's on the inside of the bowl moves across to the outside of the bowl because it's being reflected off the plate when the bowl is sitting on the plate. So that's kind of a little bit like Escher, but it kind of works out. So <clears throat> this is a dinnerware set for species of Montana and endangered species of Montana. And um, so endangered and threatened or species of concern. Um, <clears throat> so a species can be endangered in one state and be fine in the state next door because there's um, reach, you know, there's local endangered lists, and then there's the big national lists. And those are sort of different, they're different things. So these do, uh, so these are the species drawn, and then I sort of carved out um, other species. I wanted this to be singular, but have some buddies, which kind of made it kind of sad, right? Like this thing's totally isolated, like this butterfly is totally isolated, even though it has its ghost, its ghostly images, right? I thought that was a really, Kind of a powerful statement that coming together and then here's just a couple other of that set and um, i was thrilled the set went to an auction and um for the archie bray foundation of ceramic arts and um, it made some good money so i just wanted to show you these uh kind of lovely dishes uh, these were all photos were sent to me um through instagram and i was just thrilled that people were so interested in this dinnerware so here's the set all together. It was a big set. And, um, and uh, the person that now has it built a cabinet for it. And um, I've been to their house to use these. And it's, it's kind of great. You know, and I have to say that arranging food around the species is incredibly fun. Like I had fruit salad on that plate with the bird. And I just put my fruit kind of around the plate. And it was like um, part game, part nourishment. You know, it was sort of a funny, funny thing like that a little bit. So um, this, is, this is pretty exciting to me. The other thing, and this is sort of a separate note, but um, I often get a little bit frustrated at fundraisers that ceramics, pottery especially, usually doesn't bring in a, um, a lot of money because it's usually one pot or two pots. And um, that always frustrated me a little bit because that's the best way that I can support my community is through donations of my work. And so um, this is a big dinner we're set and it brought in a lot of dough. And I was really, really proud of that. So, um, it, you know, it's hard, a little bit hard to talk about endangered species. Uh, right now I'm finished with these plates and I wanted to work on something that was more substantial. And so I um, are now making urns. And I didn't put any urns in this slideshow because this is really a dinnerware talk. Um, but I'm working on the urns for the continental United States. And uh, it's a big show. It's going to take me. I've been working on it for two years and I've just finished the letter E alphabetically. Um, and there's some urns behind me. You can see them when I turn off the slideshow. But uh, I just got through the letter E. I have been making these urns for three more years. And then I have some nice commitments from museums. And I'm hoping the show will travel for about 10 years going from museum to art center to zoo um, and to um, art history museums. 
you know, are, uh, so I'm super, um, I'm super excited about this and also a little bit um, befuddled by uh, the dedication that something like this takes. So I wanted to end on kind of an up note. Last year, the um, lesser long-nosed bat, which was terribly endangered, has come off the list. And I went and found the plate for it. And um, if I was gonna show this again, I would remake it with a background gold instead of silver because it has recovered, which is just fabulous. So I think on that note, uh, Let's see here, end of slideshow, click to exit. Here we are, and I'll just stop sharing now. So I just thought I would share those uh, dishes with you, and we have about 20 more minutes, and I could start a demo. Um, hey, Chrissy, could I have my plates? My studio, uh, the gal in my studio is helping me today. And um, let's see, can you guys see me okay? Here we go. Um, so, Great. So this is one of those uh, plates. This is the Arroyo toad, and it is endangered in New Mexico. And this was from a show I sent to New Mexico, and it had um, I had maybe twenty plates in the show, and they were all species that lived with one mile of within a mile of the gallery. And uh, so uh, there's the kind of the back for it. And so I just thought that I would show you how I make these and then I can take some questions. So uh, this is fabulous gown named Chrissy. Hey Chrissy, come on in, pop your face in here. This is uh, Chrissy and she's, um, uh, she helps me in the studio and she has a space in my studio next door. And um, we're gonna have to tilt my, uh, uh, my screen quite a bit so I can show you what I'm doing. So that'll take us a little bit to adjust. And um, so I'm gonna just show you how I do the inlay and then how I, uh, how I draw on the pot. Okay, let's give it a shot, Chrissy. What do you say? Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. A little more. Oh, that, that, that's good. Okay, I hope you guys can see. I can't see you. So here's a bird, and here's one of the. Can you see okay? Yes, we can. Hope so. Okay, great. So, how this works is that I research the species uh, quite a bit um, the day before I start working on them, and I research how they mate, how many of them, where they live, what their sort of posture is, do they work traveling groups, do they travel alone, how do they mate, why are they becoming endangered? I read all of that stuff and then all of that information helps me figure out how I'm gonna make this. So I would take this drawing of this bird and I would sort of trace here. And this is just to get the anatomy close, right? Like I'm not a total freakazoid about getting it exact, but if the anatomy is off, it distracts you. So I'm just gonna sort of trace here and it's gonna make an indent on the plate. So I'm gonna kind of go like this. And it's, I have to say, incredibly fun. I cut out a lot of different shapes and sizes and arrange them. And that's where all the troubleshooting sort of happens. Get the birds in. And then after I get that done, and I have this little bit of an indent, I don't know how much you can see, but now I'm gonna come back in and I'll just draw with an X-Acto knife. I'll just start working on all these. People always ask me how long these take. I'm not really sure, because you never work on one at a time. That would be like doing your laundry and just putting one sock in. You know, we always work in groups. So, uh, but I think you guys can kind of get, start to understand what I do here. Here's the lower part of the wing. Here's the back, here's the tail. And so the, just the sort of tracing off of the uh, image just helps me land the image. And then if I need to sort of change it or turn it or something like that, I can always do that. But it helps me get close because I don't want to be distracted by a wing being a little bit too small or the grease, you know, gross beak clearly not being big enough. You know, I don't want to be distracted by all that. So uh, this is how I would sort of get get busy on this. And I do know from drawing a lot of birds about how these leaf, how the wings look like this. And we usually come back in. So then I can just brush all those crumbs off. Let's see, there we go, brush all those crumbs off. So this is a porcelain for clay folks. 
This is a cone six porcelain and it has a little bit of ball clay in it. So it's not a pure porcelain, it's a, a dirty porcelain. And, but that little bit of ball clay gives me a little bit more working time because you know how porcelain can be so finicky. So I kind of really just work on these wings like this. I kept drawing on that. And um, so sometimes I listen about the species while I'm working, but often that's just too depressing. It's kind of a depressing subject, honestly. We're not doing that great, you guys. And I'm interested in endangered species because it's sort of the canary in the coal mine, right? And like if the frogs don't make it, we're not gonna make it either. So anyways, I would do this drawing and I'd probably put in some background out here. Okay, and then what I would do is I would take some colored slip, which is this, there's a little bit, of, it's a little bit of clay with some color in, in it. And I've just sort of put a thin coat on here. I would just kind of brush a nice thin coat on here. And I would probably do three coats so it could really get thick. Now, obviously you guys, this is a demo and I didn't finish doing the bird, but I know you'll cut me some slack for that. So I put on a couple of layers of this slip. And you know, the, one of the beautiful things about doing such a big project is that you, there's a timing to it. You do a couple drawings, a couple of slips, you finish them off. You know, there's sort of a, a real rhythm in the, uh, in the studio making. So then I would let this sit for a little while, a couple of hours. Ready? Here's the Julia Child moment. Look at that. <laughs> okay. So now this is one I did a little bit earlier and there's fish on this one. There we go, there's fish on this one instead of a bird. So don't be surprised that no bird shows up. So underneath this slip, there is uh, some fish. So now I'm just wiping off the slip. <clears throat> I do use quite a bit of this colored slip. And what I do is I let it settle in the bottom of my bucket and I drain the water off. And then I gather all that slip back up and I use it again and I use it again. Uh, it really helps. Can you guys see this fish starting to reveal? Somebody could make a noise that brings. Yes, we are seeing the fish reveal. <laughs> Not totally all alone out here in Montana. No. Anyway, so this is what I'm working on right now. I just finished up these plates and now I'm working on these urns. And um, the urns are big, it's a big project. So it's moved away from dinnerware a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and I think that the commemorative plate is an area in our field that still has quite a bit of open real estate. And, um, you know, the, uh, the clay studio in Philly did a show of commemorative plates um, to celebrate the Women's Right to Vote Act. That, and um, so I made some dishes for that. I thought that was a great idea. So this is how it works. Uh, from here, it would go in a kiln. It would uh, go through the first firing and then I'd put some glaze on it and fire it again. And then I would put some luster and decal of information on the back and fire it one more time. So my friends, that is how I do that. Great. Okay. Uh, it is 20 after, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, Margaret, are there any, any questions coming our way? Anybody have any questions? Um, Margaret, do you have any questions? I'm live now. Yeah, you're live. I need to unmute you. Yeah, I, I just. Um... Margaret, you're on and we can hear you. Oh. Okay, great. So thank you, Julia. That was fascinating. Absolutely. I knew I loved your work anyway, but now that I've seen you working in the studio, I'm, I'm even more. Uh, uh, what's the word, besotted with your, your talents and everything. Uh, very impressive. Um, before we get to questions, I just want to mention um, that on uh, June 8th, we're going to be presenting the fourth in our series, uh, Setting the Standard for Setting the Table, which is Modern Women Textile Designers. And the presenters that evening will be Lindsay Pratt and Gregory Spinner, both of whom collect modern dinnerware. And they're going to share some of their favorite tablecloths. So, um, Mark your calendar, watch your emails and your Facebook. Uh, but now we want to go to questions. And I think uh, my husband has better access to the actual questions. So I'm going to turn it over to him. And uh, Bill, are you muted? Are you? Oh, okay. We're... 
we're live. Okay. And um, so let's just want to highlight uh, Julia again. Um, I can figure out how to do that. Okay, Julia. Oh, there I am. Ah! So um, we've had a few uh, comments in the chat, and again, um, if you if you'd like to ask a question, you can uh, raise your hand, and then we'll unmute you and, and let you ask the question. Um, a kind of common sentiment among the chat is uh, things like what Scott said: absolutely beautiful, but so sad. <laughs> uh, specifically talking about <laughs> yeah. the fish. Um, there was a question. Um, I assume you have helpers to make these huge assemblages. Uh, please explain your progress, your, your process. Uh, thanks. This sure, is sure, sure. Um, so the question was about if I've helped making all these things. Um, well, honestly, uh, until very recently, I was still making everything. But my fabulous studio assistant, Chrissy, who you just met, uh, assistant and friend. She uh, helps me load and unload this kilns. She helps me mix glaze, sometimes glaze them if it's just a simple dunk. Um, all of the really active hands-on making part I do, uh, but <clears throat> especially when it comes time to pack up a show, you know, that's um, the first urn show was 12 pallets. Oh no, was two pallets of pots shipping all the way across the country. And so I flew some people out to help me hang the show. So a lot of the help that I get is from, is that kind of like the heavy lifting more than the making. Though this summer I am for the first time having somebody come out to help me throw urns. Because if I'm throwing them, uh, if I work on urns seven days a week and I'm throwing for one day and I'm trimming and making lids fit the second day. And then the other five days I'm carving. And um, <clears throat> I need to move faster than that. So uh, for the first time, I'm having a thrower come work with me. Uh, the urns here on this side, like this, these are the current urns that I'm working on. Hey, Chrissy, could you get me a bisque urn that has some obvious carving? She's here to help me out today. She's in the room next door with her studio. Um, so the urns are heavily, heavily carved. And that's really where all the decision making is. And I think the, uh, the shapes are simple enough that um, somebody else can throw them for me. Um, so let's see. So this is, I don't know if you guys can see that. You see the salamander? Yes. And you can see the little, uh, the little tadpoles down on the bottom. There they are growing up, becoming bigger, bigger salamanders. So this is the big urn project. These are the endangered species. And you can see it's a pretty generic urn shape, which was really on purpose. Um, so uh, I, I hope that answers that person's question. And I think a question that was asked uh, fairly early on, um, are your works uh, done individually or in groups? I think maybe we know the answer to that. And um, are, do you do work that's commissioned? Oh, uh, you know what? I really don't do any commission because I got to keep up with the endangered species right now. Um, and there's so many good potters that can do that. Um, oddly, the first urn show, which are the urns behind me, you'll see that was the very first. Those are the urns just of New England. I was stunned that people bought them for, to put their ashes in for real. And like couples would come in, they'd want to see if those species were like got along or not. You know, so I thought it was just wild. Um, uh, so I haven't, I haven't done, um, I've done commissions only familia, like my, um, uh, one of my uncles died. And so I made an urn for him after I started the urns. But I don't, I, I just, I, I gotta, I gotta get on it. So I, no commissions for me right now. Thanks though. I, I see we have a, a raised hand with Anna. And I think I need the, uh, uh, the library to uh, <laughs> let her in. So, so Anna, please uh, go ahead and ask your question. Oh, I, I wanted to know if I could see some of the urns. Besides the one with the salad, oh. there's some behind you. Oh, sure. Hey, Chrissy, could you help me out? It's a little tricky for me to get up from, you know, I'll bump the computer. So she's going to, what's behind me there? Somebody's asking about these. They want to see a few more of these carved ones. While she's getting them for me, uh, somebody asked direct message to me that the pieces are cast. They're thrown on the wheel. Somebody asked if they're being sold. 
um, the endangered species urns or not. Oh, hey. Oh, one thing about this endangered species project, my sister is a botanist and the plates I only made, I didn't make any plants. And you know, I caught holy hell for my sister. She's a botanist. So I have to do the plants now for the urns <laughs> for uh, North America. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, big sister, she's telling me. So you guys, these haven't, aren't glazed yet. They're still bisque. Honestly, I'm still figuring out how to glaze them. After two years, you think I'd work it out? Not yet. Mm -hmm. I don't have it worked out. You want to give me one more? Another plant, right? another plant? Sure, we'll take another plant. Um, Melinda Simon asked where my work is sold and um, I'm not selling any of these urns. They're gonna travel all together. And oh, uh, this is such a charmer. Oh, you guys, the leaves, leaves. Oh, they're just killers. They take so long. Let me tell you, the, the whales take like a half a day. Leaves, four days, that's it. Plants, they just take forever. I mean, look at all that. You can see all that, it's crazy. Um, but also so fun. I mean, it's such a pleasure to really focus. And you know what also is super cool is that I can see I'm getting better. Like the first ones are not so good. And now that I'm 310 in, they're really looking better. Here we go. Um, so I do do two sales of more traditional pottery, which is what you're looking at over here. Um, twice a year and the money from that helps support the endangered species project and i sell my work through a radius gallery here in missoula and i'll actually have a show there uh in june 5th so oh i gotta get busy but um uh so um but radius is fabulous and they take very good care of me and they support so many local potters and they show student work which is so fabulous okay what other questions you got Okay, uh, there's a question uh, from Miriam. How long does it take to make 1,200 plates for a show? <laughs> um, uh, the Pennsylvania plates, that was about six months. Six months? And Yep, about six months, yeah, yeah. Oh, things my somebody asked me if I get help. So uh, Chrissy and then there's a couple other folks that help me, especially at the end when there's a big push. <coughs> But the biggest help I get is that I walk my dog once a day and then somebody else walks my dog a second time. And that gives me a lot more studio time. So uh, yeah, so that, that's a huge help. Sure. If I have uh, over the weekend, I plan ahead, I have all my meals ready to go and I just am in the studio and I'm just cranking, I can get a lot done. Uh, but you gotta be, be prepared. And I also never answer my emails in my studio. Oh, what was that? Sorry, say it again. Julia, it's me, Margaret. I wondered how you have time to teach. How do you have time um, to teach? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Margaret, I get this question a lot. And, um, uh, you know, I don't have kids. I just have a dog. And so that's a ton of time right there. And I'm just incredibly stubborn about getting to the studio. And um, I'm pretty com compartmentalized, I think, probably. Oh. And um, I, I just, have, um, people ask me that all the time, how I get so much done. And the truth is I'm just hyper-focused and um, I am as well-prepared as I can be. And that saves me a lot of time. That's very impressive, so. everything. <laughs> um, Carol just wrote in the text, are your raised designs carved or wiped off or added. They're all carved. And I mostly use um, X-Acto knives with the tips cut off. That's sort of my main carving tool. And, um, and things like this, that's pretty much what I use for everything. And uh, they're carved quite deep. They can go up to a eighth of an inch deep. And um, I try to channel uh, um, Adelaide Rubino all the time. She was such a brilliant carver. I'm inspired by her. So kind of a related question. Do you ever use decals? Um, you know, I haven't. I don't have anything against it. Um, I've used them quite a bit. <clears throat> there was a body of work I didn't show you guys with the clouds and I had decals of the world on the bottom of the pots and the clouds on the top of the pots. And that was sort of the perfect line quality. Um, <clears throat> But, uh, I, you know, I just haven't really gotten there. Um, I love that quality of the inlay, the crispness of it. Uh, 
probably if I was making pots for a living, I would figure out how to make the decals work. Um, but right now I still am making one, 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 you know? So decals would be, it I'm not sure that would quite work out for what I'm, where I'm trying to get to. It's not a philosophical thing at all. It's just about trying to get to my body of work. So there, there's a comment from uh, Florida Craft Art in St. Petersburg. They love sure. showing your urns for the exhibit environmentally engaged. <laughs> and they you know, that was great. They there was a video a, presentation there was... at the time. I did. That was a wonderful show. You know, it was great. One of the other artists in the show was did paintings of the flowers and it was one of the it was on the flowers were on the urn. One of the urns I sent them had the same flower on it. I thought that was really special. But do we have time for one more question? Somebody wrote in the um, chat directly to me, if you ever interacted personally with any of the David speeches you have highlighted on your work. Um, so I haven't ever met a nationally endangered species, but I have met species that are uh, endangered in my state. Um, and uh, that's not totally true. Once I was swimming, and I, there was a green turtle in the water, I was in the ocean, and there was uh, a, or maybe six green turtles altogether, which is pretty uncommon. Um, I was in Hawaii and, uh, and <clears throat> the turtle swam into me, like I was sort of standing there like waist deep, just kind of hanging out. And this thing bumped my leg, scared the crap out of me. Uh, and I yelped and I jumped back and I looked down and the turtle is so, um, like premortal, like they're so raw and slow and um, kind of grotesque in the most beautiful way. And so I put on my goggles and I dropped down below the ocean and I could see them swimming so slowly. They're such slow movers, sort of swaying with the water. And I, I just wept and I just gagged and wept. And it was really, um, uh, and then I thought like, you better get busy, Jules, you better get busy oh. right now because these are amazing things. Well, I think we're gonna wrap this up this evening. Julia, that was just fantastic. Uh, we'll be talking and uh, I wanna thank everyone for participating, uh, but particularly Julia for this. Thank you so much. You bet, thanks everybody. Good night, everybody. Okay.